Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we have a special interview with an award-winning documentary filmmaker on his latest film called Jay Accused that looks at Lithuania's role uh, during the Holocaust and their attempts to cover it up. <laughs> Well, welcome to the programme and uh, today's uh, special guest is a documentary filmmaker. His name is uh, Michael uh, Kurtzner and uh, you're from the Warwick area but originally from, from Zimbabwe. Um, so I just want to thank you for making the film that you've made, uh, Jay Accused. Uh, I watched it last night, it was very powerful, extremely moving, highlighting Lithuania's role um, during the Holocaust. But can we just start with, with your own personal uh, Jewish story? Uh, you are born in, um, in Zimbabwe. Um, share with us what your jo Jewish childhood was like uh, in Zimbabwe in Africa. Well, hi Simon, thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure. Um, most of the Jews in southern Africa, and there was quite a big population there at one stage, about 120,000 people perhaps, most of them came from Lithuania, which was a great Jewish civilization for, civilization for six centuries. And the reason they came to South Africa is there were two mail ships that used to run, I think, from Southampton every week. So they had all these empty berths, so they thought, well, why not make some money by putting Jews into these berths? And at that stage, Jews were allowed into South Africa, and that explains um, the, uh, the immigration run that took place between those two countries. My own grandfathers and grandmothers all immigrated there between 1910 and 1920. And my family uh, left South Africa for political reasons, and they went to live in what was then Southern Rhodesia. There was federation there, which was a kind of liberal experiment before it became the independent country of Rhodesia under UDI. So that's the reason we were, we were, we were, uh, that I was born there and that my parents went to live there. It was a classic Lithuanian, and the shorthand for Lithuanian Jewish is the word Litvak. It was a, a very much a Litvak community, which meant it was steeped in orthodoxy, although often people didn't believe. They were also exposed to many contemporary political ideas, socialism, Zionism, all the others. Um, but for the most part, we had fairly orthopraxic lives. In other words, we had an orthodox synagogue. We had our bar mitzvahs done in the orthodox way. Many Jews were kosher. My own parents weren't. My own parents actually were indifferent to that sort of thing. That's something I picked up much later in my life. But certainly we lived in the one neighborhood which was identifiably Jewish, Kamala in Bulawayo. And we were, to, for all intents and purposes, a Litvak community. It was only when I, when I went back to Lithuania that I realized just how much we owed to our Lithuanian past uh, to explain our practice and the way we thought and the way we, 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 we were brought up. Um, this was all, Lithuania was hidden from us really as we grew up because of the horrors of what happened there. And uh, Michael, do you also share with us um, your move to, uh, to England in 1976 to pursue a, a career in journalism where you were a travel writer for the Sunday Times and then went on to become a documentary filmmaker for both the BBC and, and Channel 4. But share with us how you got involved in, in journalism and what attracted you to, to the profession. Uh, well, I actually studied law and I came to England to complete my degree. I studied in London. Um, and finished the law degree, but it was never my intention to, to be a lawyer. I only did that for my mother, really, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I always wanted to be a journalist because I love stories, and I always found the world a very interesting place, perhaps because I grew up in a kind of little informal Jewish ghetto. I was always peering over the, over the fence at the world outside, particularly in Africa, but also in Europe. And so when I came to this wonderful country of Britain, where one was free to think, read, and write what one, li what one liked, it was, uh, it was my absolute goal to become a journalist. I got my first job on the Coventry Evening Telegraph, which was probably my best job and most enjoyable job ever, reporting on flower shows and court reports and sports and things like that. And so I came to understand something of the English way of life. Uh, and then I moved into more serious journalism, and I, I always wanted to make films. Films seemed to me the most expressive way of telling, telling stories and expressing ideas. 
So I was lucky to work for the BBC for about eight years. I also made films for Channel 4 and ITV. Um, but it was always documentary film that, that, that interested me the most. Uh, what is it about the documentary film format that, that attracts you so much? Um, because there is so much content you have to, to record, there's so many interviews, as well as all the kind of background footage and photographs, and then put it all together to tell a, 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 a really compelling and, and moving story. I think documentary works best to express ideas in their full form, in other words, to convey the emotion of an idea, as well as something of the factual nature of that idea. I don't think it's the most intellectual form of, of media. If you want something more intellectual, really, it should be academic, where it's cross-referenced, where it's peer-reviewed and things like that. But what I've done in my film is have the benefit of many scholars, and I like to think that the facts represented in my film, remember, mo many of them are contentious, because Lithuania has done its best to make them contentious, even when they were perfectly clear what they are, they do their best to muddy the waters always, um, was, this was the best way of expressing this story. This actually is a family story. Um, as I say, in South Africa, we grew up not knowing much about Lithuania, because really, my grandparents' generation and my parents' generation I don't think could face this horror. How can you explain to young children that everybody in your family was murdered after weeks of, of, of torture and humiliation? I don't think it's possible to bring children up positively in that, uh, with that knowledge. So although I grew up obviously knowing, knowing about the Holocaust, it was there everywhere in our lives, it is I think for all Jewish post-war Jewish families, we didn't know much about the details of Lithuania. And it was only when I went back in uh, 2019 to attend uh, an unveiling of a monument which sought to name the 2,400 Jews who were murdered in a day in my own hometown, Birge. And we had this uh, fabric draped over this lovely monument. And the drape was pulled down and I found myself staring at a wall of Kretzmas, my own name. And this is what happened to my family. And suddenly in that instance, literally there were scores of them, probably 80. Uh, I looked at this list and suddenly so many secrets of my own family became clear why there were so few of us, why my father was always so angry, why my grandmother was depressed. Um, it answered a million uh, questions that had rooted somewhere in, 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 my, in my soul, but I hadn't really had the occasion to, to ask. Incidentally, on the naming thing, so successful were the murderers in, in Lithuania that of the 2,400 Jews who were murdered in Birge on the 8th of August 1941, they could only name 50, uh, 555. All the other names are lost, and that's true right across Lithuania. There are 200 mass killing sites in Lithuania. It was the most successful Holocaust in Europe, not in terms of numbers, but in terms of proportions. There are only four with any names at all. Not only did they kill us, they also wiped out our names, which I find an incredible insult and very, very tragic. Uh, absolutely horrific as well. M Michael, share with us um, this kind of hidden history, because essentially uh, your excellent documentary, uh, uh, JQs actually highlights this hidden history uh, of what happened to your community, the Jewish community in Lithuania during the Second World War. Why is it that you had to do this research and why has it been so hidden for almost 80 years? I'm certainly not the first to have done this and I'm certainly not the most prestigious to have done this. There have been great people working on this for decades. Um, there's DefendingHistory.com, an excellent resource. There's Ephraim Zuroff, there's Ruta Venegaita, and then there's Sylvia Foti and Grant Goshen, who have been working on this for decades. I've only been working on it for three years, so I'm the lowest of that list. But I think the reason that people didn't go into it, even though the facts were fairly well established, was because uh, of the pain it caused from the Jewish side. And from the non-Jewish side, maybe it's the same, or maybe they're just bored by it. I have no idea why Europe has so, such little real interest in the Holocaust. They're, they're great at uh, preening themselves and saying how much they care about it, but I don't believe it for a moment. I think the entire enterprise has been to forget, and they've done a very successful job, most uh, overtly in, in places like Lithuania, which were, incidentally, the worst killing grounds of the Holocaust. 
Uh, and show us how your film Jay Accuse actually came about. Uh, show us the idea. Obviously, your experience in Lithuania is probably life changing. It affected you personally. So this is a very personal film, essentially about what happened to your family and the rest of the Jewish community in Lithuania. But why was this such a, a, a passion, almost bordering on obsession, to get this film made so that uh, you could expose what the Lithuanian government was actually hiding and also these horrendous crimes against humanity, against the Jewish people during the Holocaust? You've got it dead right. It did become an obsession. And what happened is I went to Lithuania, and I think as a form of emotional protection, I looked at everything through the lens of a film. I made a film when I went there for that naming ceremony. And after that film, I made a piece that reflected the fact that people joined us on the walk to the thing, and there were lots of Lithuanian officials. And basically, Simon, I fell for all their nonsense propaganda. I honestly thought this was a country that had come to terms honestly with what it had done and was uh, requesting um, an accommodation with the Jewish people based on truth. And after that, uh, Lithuanian television through another company offered me a lot of money to make a film called Letter to Lithuania, very grand, very pompous. And I was keen to do it. And um, I, was in the, in, 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 I was researching this film um, when I suddenly realized that things were not what they seemed to be. That, all, that, that really what I'd been exposed to in my own hometown, where those 2,400 people were, killed, were murdered, Birge it's called, was all stage-managed propaganda and all there to sanitize uh, Lithuania's public image. Um, and what made me absolutely aware of this was the way they kept offering me money. They kept throwing money at, at me. I never accepted a penny. I never took a penny. But it seemed odd to me that they were offering money for something I hadn't even done yet. I had done no work on it. And I suddenly realized the reason they're doing this is because I'm a Jew and they think a Jew can't refuse money. Honestly, they're as stupid as that. That's what they thought. And by that stage, I was already starting to read uh, the work of Sylvia Foti that hero of our times, and Grant Goshen, and other people. And I suddenly realized what a great fraud had taken place, and how successful Lithuania had been in disguising and lying about its own uh, Holocaust past. When I realized that, I made a promise one day, I made a promise both to my murdered family and to God, that I would do whatever I could to, um, to, 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 um, to fight this outrage. I had nothing, I was retired, I didn't have any money, I was a small, sh I had a little farm I'd built in a little bit of land I'd, uh, I'd cultivated in the middle of the West Midlands, um, but I'm, and I was already 10 years retired, um, but I made a promise that I would do whatever I could to fight this outrage, and the only way I could fight was to make a film, and from that moment I set about making this film. Amazing. So let's have a look at the extract of this excellent film that exposes Lithuania's role during the Holocaust. How do we, the Jews of Lithuania, tell our story? How do we describe our 600-year-old community, a gem of the Jewish exile? how to reveal our historic contribution to both Torah study and modernity. Are there words to describe the cruelty of our slaughter without parallel, even in Holocaust Europe? We'll start our story with the birth of two Lithuanian children, a boy and a girl. The girl is Catholic, a sort of Lithuanian princess. I grew up in a very Lithuanian family in the heart of the Lithuanian community in Chicago, which was in Market Park at the time. And I spoke Lithuanian first before English. Even though I was born in Chicago, I spoke Lithuanian first. And uh, when I went to kindergarten, I, I couldn't speak English. The boy is Jewish. He is born in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Three of my grandparents were born in the old country, and my fourth grandparent was first generation born in South Africa. His, his mother was from Kovno, so we were an entirely Litvak family. The area around Market Park 
was super Lithuanian. In that area is the Nativity Church, Nativity BBM, and that's where my parents got married. And then there's Holy Cross Hospital, which was run by the Sisters of St. Casimir, and that's where I was born. Then next to Holy Cross Hospital uh, was Maria High School, also run by the Sisters of St. Casimir, and that's where I went to high school. That's where almost all the Lithuanian girls went if they lived in that area. My mother went there. And life in Port Elizabeth was just taking the shtetl from Lithuania and moving it to Port Elizabeth. The community was Jewish. The way we grew up was Jewish. Even though we were living at the bottom tip of Africa, it was a Lithuanian Jewish lifestyle. There was the 69th Street called the Lithuanian Plaza. My grandmother lived like half a block away. She never really had to learn English. She could, she could exist completely and totally speaking Lithuanian for the most part. My grandfather used to tell me stories about the old country. Every conversation had some component about the old country, but there was always a huge gap and, and a secret. He used to show me photographs from the old country and he used to say, this is so-and-so and this is so-and-so. And I'd say, and where, where, where do they live? And then there would be silence. One day I went to my uncle and I said to my uncle, tell me, tell me what my grandparents are hiding. And my uncle had the most horrendous response. He, he actually started screaming at me. He said, don't you ever ask your grandparents those questions. Do you know how much pain it causes them? Sylvia Fodi's grandfather was a dashing Lithuanian war hero. His name was Jonas Nodreka. My mother and my grandmother would tell me stories about him, and I learned to be very, very proud of him. I had heard that he tried to save the country from the communists, and he was caught by the KGB and uh, imprisoned in the KGB prison, and that's where he died. And he died at the age of 36, a martyr for the country. I, I felt like a princess, uh, because everywhere we would go, my mother, who was an opera singer and rather a flamboyant personality anyway, uh, would say, look, here's my daughter, Sylvia, the, the granddaughter of Jonas Nareka, and everybody would go, ooh, ah, how wonderful. So this was a common experience, maybe every weekend in some ways. So that's an extract from GRQ's, um, such a powerful, such a moving and such an important documentary. And, and again, it's such a pleasure to have you on the programme discussing this film that you've made and the personal cost that you've gone through to actually make this film. I'm so pleased you've done it. Uh, but can you share with us your, your two main characters in this film? So we have uh, Grant uh, Goshen, who is uh, born Jewish in, in South Africa but of Jewish uh, Lithuanian descent, and uh, Sylvia um, Foti, uh, born in the US, obviously from a Lithuanian family, who's, who's the granddaughter of uh, Jonas, uh, sorry, if I pronounce the name right, uh, Nikaria, who uh, was- Nonreka. Nonreka, sorry, Nonreka, who she believed from a mother and from a grandmother that he was a, a Lithuanian war hero, uh, and the end ends up being a, a, a Nazi war criminal. Um, so share with us uh, about the two characters and how you were able to blend their two stories into one, uh, really on their incredible quest for the truth. They are both two, to my mind, um, real heroes. Grant has been working on the story for 35 years. Uh, Sylvia for a little bit less, but probably 25 years. And both of them um, were, in a way, led into this uh, challenge through promises to grandparents. Grant promised his late grandfather that he would say Kaddish for the family that were murdered and try and find survivors. Of course, there were none. And Sylvia made a promise to her mother and her grandmother that she would finish the heroic biography of her grandfather, Jonas Noreka, um, whatever happened. 
And so both started their journeys together. Uh, Grant, very quickly, because it was knowledge for decades before, uh, that Jonas Nareka was a, was a mass murderer. So in, in some ways, Grant's role was slightly less difficult because the facts were there. Sylvia's was much more difficult because in order to get to the truth, Sylvia had to go against her family, her people, her community, the Lithuanian, <coughs> the Lithuanian community in Chicago, and her country, which she regards as Lithuania. To me, Sylvia is one of the bravest people I've ever met. Uh, I think in many ways, the Lithuanian community, the expat, Lithuanian community is similar to the expat Jewish communities. They're deeply sensitive, they're very uh, patriotic, very proud of where they come from, they're very, um, they uh, a little bit paranoid. The Lithuanians have good reason to be paranoid, being a, a very close neighbor of Russia, um, and very insular. So for Sylvia to do that, I kind of understand the pressures that would have been brought to bear on her. And she did it through years and years of struggle. And the cost to her was so enormous. She lost everything in the writing of her book. But she discharged her promise. And to her enormous credit, she told the absolute truth. And as she says in the film, the reason she did it is because of her Christian faith. That is what drove her to tell the truth. She is, to my mind, one of the greatest people I've ever met. And I wish her nothing but uh, success in this, because her success, a lot depends on this. One thing that depends on it is the veracity of the Holocaust and the way we tell this story. Because if Lithuania gets away with its lies, then clearly the Holocaust will have come to mean nothing, which doesn't protect us against future Holocausts and doesn't do justice to what happened between 1939 and 1945. Absolutely. So let's have a look at the uh, second extract of this a wonderful and very powerful and moving documentary, uh, JQs. So before I uh, left Lithuania, I got a strange call. And he says, I'm just calling to say that I'm sorry more of the country's leaders didn't come. And I said, okay, why didn't they come? And he said, because of the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews say? And he just sighed. I could just hear him sigh. And the more Lithuanians I started talking to about this, it's like a lot of Lithuanians knew that my grandfather was involved, heard the rumor that he was involved in killing Jews. Um, so it's like this open secret that everybody knew except me, it seemed. I was convincing myself that it is just communist propaganda. I come back to Chicago and I talk to my father and, you know, other people. And I'm like, have you heard this crazy rumor about my grandfather killing Jews? And like, yeah, we heard it. I'm like, what? I'm like, this is common knowledge. Like, lots of people have heard this and I've never heard this. And I said, how come nobody ever told me? And they're like, well, it's not true. Why would we talk about it? It's just communist propaganda. Okay. So um, I went into denial for more than, uh, for about 10 years. I don't know the exact date, but it was about, about 10 years. It took me a long, long time uh, to accept this, that this was really true. P part of the process in accepting it was deciding that I wanted to continue with the story. Because at this point, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I was all alone doing this. And I just knew already that if I continue with this book, I was going to disgrace Lithuania. And it was one of the turning points for me, psychologically, internally, to decide to still go ahead and do it. I'm doing this for the love of Lithuania. Because if it's the truth, you have to face it. And I feel like this, this is the patriotic thing to do. This is what it means to be a patriot of Lithuania. Because if we don't face this, and if Lithuania doesn't face this, it cannot become healthy.
and strong and move forward with grace. Grant Goshen's discovery that Jonas Nareka, the murderer of his family, was a Lithuanian national hero, sparked a fierce determination to fight back. The first hurdle was to claim his Lithuanian citizenship. I provided Lithuania with my grandfather's documents. The fact that my grandfather had fought for Lithuanian independence, and they were so adamant that they were not going to issue citizenship to a Jew. They denied his service to the country. They slandered his service. He had a small photograph of him in his Lithuanian military uniform. I took this photograph and went to Lithuania's preeminent military historian. And the historian looked at the epaulets on my grandfather's uniform, identified my, identified my grandfather's unit, went to the archives, to that unit's records, and found my grandfather's records. So we could present to the court that my grandfather fought in the Lithuanian military. The Lithuanian government's position was that the military historian could be lying. I was so angry and so insulted. How dare somebody insult such a fine, decent human being after what they had done to the rest of the family? I was, this is not going to stand. So I launched my first lawsuit. During Goshen's Kafkaesque battle to prove that his grandfather was indeed his grandfather, he offered a well-known aunt as a witness. Her name was Esther Barzell. She was born in a shtetl called Rogova in Lithuania. Esther was a very unique woman. She was one of Nelson Mandela's closest friends. She was imprisoned for her, for her fight in the liberation struggle in South Africa. Her cell was in the cell next door to Mr. Mandela's. My uncle's cell was just a little bit further down from Mr. Mandela's. My uncle was tortured to death in solitary confinement by the South African regime. My Aunt Esther Barsel, who is known as one of the greatest heroes of the South African liberation struggle, wrote a letter of testimony for the Lithuanian court saying that she had known my grandfather for most of her life. And yes, he was Lithuanian, a Jew, and my grandfather. Without even looking at the testimony, the government of Lithuania called one of South Africa's greatest national heroes unreliable and dismissed her testimony. It became so obvious that the denials were based on anti-Semitism. And you can see from that extract of the documentary, uh, JQs, uh, what an incredible people uh, Sylvia and Grant are, uh, their passion and hunger for truth and justice. And we can all learn something from their incredible example. Um, Michael, can you just maybe give us an underlying uh, history lesson as why the Lithuanians carried out the massacres against the Jewish people without much help or cooperation or encouragement from the Nazis when they were occupied? I think certainly the Nazis gave them ideological encouragement and also gave them legal agency to do it. But uh, many of the worst uh, atrocities happened before actually the Nazis came in. It was after the Russians had left. There was the build-up of propaganda that had happened through fascist organizations and nationalist uh, organizations in the years preceding that. But to be honest with you, I don't know why such cruelty was visited on, 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 on the Jewish people who, as I say, had lived there for 600 years, for the most part, rather peacefully. 
One of the things that characterizes particularly the rural Lithuanian Holocaust, and that's opposed to, the, say, the killing of 70,000 Jews in Vilna at the Panari Forest, where 70,000 were murdered. Uh, in the villages, it was different. It could be 11 people, maybe one family, maybe two family, or 100, or 2,000, or 1,000. And these murders were often committed uh, by their neighbors. But what characterized it was the period before, and this is the most important period, where there was a deliberate attempt to dehumanize us, to torture us, to kill children in front of parents. Rape was a very, very common weapon used against the youngest of girls. The killing of old men, particularly religious men, that was a particular target. The setting fire of beards, uh, immolations, uh, the cutting off of heads, the splitting apart of bodies, and also the incarceration of entire Jews. This happened under Noreika's rule, where all the Jews of Plunga, about 40% of the town, were herded into the synagogue. They were kept there for three weeks in the summer heat, and they were deprived of water and food. And the reason I think, I think a lot about this was the need for this dehumanization. Why was it so important to the people who hated us? And that was because in our last moments before we were murdered, they wanted us to say there is no God, there is no value to being Jewish. That's what they wanted to drive out of us. The humiliation in many ways, to my mind, was actually worse than the murders because it utterly reduced us to the level of animals and it sought to strip from us all the dignity we'd accrued in the last, well, almost 4,000 years of our national life as, as Jewish people. Uh, as to why people did this, I'm afraid you have to ask them. I don't know. I'm as mystified as anybody by the cruelty and the extent of that cruelty. And, and of course, today, uh, Lithuania haven't come to terms with, with their crimes that they committed during the uh, Second World War and the Holocaust in particular. But, but do you think that um, church replacement theology uh, and that dangerous teaching, uh, Bible teaching, uh, that says that, uh, that the Christians have replaced the Jewish people and the plan of God was ultimately what uh, caused these uh, uh, mass mur murders against the Jewish people in Lithuania. I have no doubt it played a part. How else then can normal people murder 300 children in a day. How can you take babies and smash their skulls against trees to save bullets unless you believe they are subhuman, unless you believe they are the enemy of humanity, unless you believe they are guilty of killing God? It's the only way you can come to a moral formulation like that, which enables such practices. As I say, Simon, I'm no expert at this, but I do feel this is something the Christian world has to consider. And they also have to consider the, the um, wanton way Lithuania lies. Lithuania actually has an institute that is there, it employs over a hundred historians to make up lies about the Holocaust so they can continue to hero worship mass murderers like Noreika. There's a school named after Noreika, his monuments there, there are streets named after him. This is a man who killed 14 and a half thousand people and presided over an empire of utter debased cruelty. Yet they will go to any lengths to try and resurrect his name and declare him innocent when everybody knows he's guilty. I'm afraid I just cannot understand it, but I think replacement theology must play a part in that. So let's have a look at another extract of JQs, and this time looking at the uh, cruelties that the Lithuanians committed against their own Jewish civilians. For Sylvia Foti, the cruelty of her grandfather's regime was profoundly traumatic. I have heard stories where Jews ran from Lithuanians to the Germans, asking for Germans for help from the Lithuanians. And for me to be part of that, at least by heritage and blood, is so painful. I, I want to disassociate myself from it. The other two personal items of family history are especially painful to Sylvia. The first is this photograph of a party in Blunga, taken two weeks after the massacre. So in the picture were uh, 100 Lithuanians from Plunga in like five, seven rows, standing, the sun is in their eyes. 
and it's a afternoon and there my my father my grandfather was there my grandmother was there my mother was in the lap of my grandfather's sister Antonella And it took me a long time to, to piece this together. This is why it took me, you know, I, in 2013, I didn't connect this yet. But later as I'm writing the story, five, you know, through those five years and I'm putting this together, I'm like, son of a gun. They had a party after all these 2000 Jews were, like half the town went missing and they're having a party. And one of the stages of genocide is a celebration of the genocide. And so that's what that was. It's a celebration of the genocide. Although the genocide center right, I put there says, oh no, they were just celebrating getting rid of the communists. That was a, it, was, it has nothing to do about killing Jews. The second are two grotesquely personal items looted by Nareka. There were like, bookshelves, maybe like a mirror, some clothing. But there were also like these two nightcaps um, that people, I guess, used to wear on their heads to go to sleep, to stay warm. I have this image of him and my grandmother in bed wearing these nightcaps. And I think, how is this possible? And they were not the only two Lithuanians doing this. It is possible that every single Lithuanian home in Lithuania has some Jewish artifact. That is possible, and I wonder. Lithuania, you are a country blessed with heroes. Jonas Paulovicius is one. One August day in 1941, he saw a Jewish man shot in the street. This man was one of about 600 intellectuals murdered on that day just outside Kaunas. Paulovicius swore to devote his life to saving Jews. And together with his wife, Antonina, son Kestutis, and daughter Danute, saved 16 Jews. Neighbors and relatives only found out when the Russians arrived, and these pale, almost naked people emerged from their underground hideouts. And what happened to this hero? On May the 1st, 1952, he was shot in the head through an open window as he slept. The murder went unpunished. Jonas Paulovicius, his wife Antonina, son Kestutis, and daughter Danute are named Righteous Among the Nations, by Israel's Yad Vashem, its highest possible honor. And the Republic of Lithuania? It awarded them the life-saving cross, its 22nd highest award. And it's absolutely imperative uh, that, uh, that Michael is, uh, uh, gets justice. The Jewish community from Lithuania get justice uh, and the truth is told. And, and again, well done for making such a powerful and, and remarkable documentary. But, but can you share with us um, the extent of the atrocities that were committed in Lithuania and, and then the cover up? Because, yeah, there was a, we know after the Second World War, the, uh, the Soviet Union took control of Lithuania. It was under communist rule until the collapse of the, uh, the Berlin Wall in 89 and then the collapse of the Soviet uh, Empire back in 91 and then Lithuania became an independent nation again. So um, share with us the extent of the atrocities and the extent of the cover-up after uh, Lithuania became an independent country. Um, the Holocaust in Lithuania was the most successful in all of Europe in terms of the proportions murdered. 96.4% um, um, of all Lithuanian Jews were murdered. And remember, each of those Jews that was, every Jew that was murdered was also humiliated, tortured, imprisoned, robbed. Every sing that happened to every single one. So 96.4% amounted to about 220,000 people. 
And to this day, Lithuania denies any responsibility. There was a list called the Malamud list, uh, compiled by a guy called Joseph Malamud, who was a, free, uh, a partisan fighter. He managed to escape from Kovno, Kaunas. Um, and he compiled a list of murderers and came to about 21,000. This list was supposed to be verified by the Lithuanian authorities, who, of course, did everything they could to bury and ignore it, which they did successfully. And so no list of murderers has ever been published. And in fact, not one single murderer, torturer, abuser, robber from the entire Lithuanian Holocaust has ever been punished. In other words, by creating a false narrative, by creating a historical institute that is there to tell lies about the Holocaust, Lithuania has escaped scot-free. And worse than that, they've lied to their own people. So their people have no idea about this. Um, and uh, to my mind, this is a, a wrong that has to be righted. This cannot be allowed to persist. And because of Sylvia Foti, um, they won't get away with it this time. Um, she is our best opportunity to tell the truth about what happened in Lithuania. And um, we are extraordinarily lucky to have a woman of such moral caliber. Absolutely. And how have the uh, Lithuanian authorities taken to your documentary? Uh, and share with us the, the kind of their response to, to your documentary, JRQs. Well, this has been really interesting. When it was shown in South Africa, it was shown we expected about 5,000 viewers. I allowed it to be shown online because I wanted the South African Jewish community, who are probably the most conspicuously Lithuanian Litva community in the world, uh, to have an opportunity to see this, to learn something about their own grandparents and their history. Uh, it made a huge impact. Over 100,000 actually ended up watching it. And it was, uh, honestly, it electrified the community. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that. Lithuania, the Lithuanian ambassador to South Africa, was due to make a, a statement about this. And uh, as I understand it, minutes before he pulled out, and they, to this day, they have never said a single word. They are hoping that if they cover their ears and uh, close their eyes, it will just go away. I've got news for them, it won't. But to this, to, this, uh, to this moment, they've never said a word about it. They haven't responded. And when it comes to Holocaust denial, um, can you just uh, explain to us the magnitude of this? Because it's believed to be about 750,000 to a million people who were directly involved in making the Holocaust actually happen, from the Nazi SS officers to the German troops to uh, the Nazi collaborators like the Lithuanians who murdered the Jewish people during the Holocaust, but only about less than 5% have ever been prosecuted. Um, and the worst atrocity, I think, is, is the fact that many of these Nazi collaborators, particularly uh, mass murderers that we saw in Lithuania, fled after the uh, Soviet invasion of, uh, um, of uh, Eastern Europe, fled to the West set up new lives for themselves in Britain, the United States, despite the British and the American governments knowing that they collaborated in the Holocaust, that they've got blood in their hands, and they're able to build a new life themselves with ev without ever facing justice. I mean, that is as bad as, as the Holocaust itself. I think it obliges us to reflect on what the moral principles that drive um, Europe and Judeo-Christian culture are. Do we take this seriously? Do we take this mass murder seriously? Uh, we are told that we do. The EU never stops banging on about it, how important the Holocaust day is, and they fetishize it to that extent. But really, they allow Lithuania, which has European protection, NATO protection, to get away with absolute lies about it. And the lies are there in order to enable them to hero worship mass murderers. I don't know how they square this with their own moral pronouncements. They clearly don't think it's important. And I'm sorry to say many Jewish organizations equally don't. It's convenient to forget these things. My view is that Sylvia Foti represents a challenge, both a, Christ a Christian challenge and a Jewish challenge. From the Jewish point of view, we have an obligation to support somebody who tells the truth. She is, in fact, a contemporary rescuer. What she's rescuing is the truth. As for the Christian world, I think they have a duty to at last have a look at this and to take it seriously. Do I expect them to? No, I don't. And the secular European world? No, they're also wanting to forget because they're more convenient things to think about. Much better to bash Israel than think about the Holocaust. 
So let's have a look at the uh, final uh, extract of JQs, and this time is looking at the whole issue of Holocaust denial. And what of our murderers? What were their names? Thanks to this extraordinary man, we do have some idea. Joseph A. Malamud escaped the slaughter in Kaunas to fight with the partisans. He compiled this list of over 20,000 Lithuanian killers. Malamud's list was never officially published because of Lithuanian objections. A deal was apparently struck. The list would be suppressed until the Lithuanian scholars had done their own research. Their research was never done, so no names have ever been released. Where did our rapists, torturers and murderers go? Mostly they went west, to a town near you. When the Soviets were coming into Lithuania, the Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators knew that the Soviets would punish them for their crimes. So many of the perpetrators went west. They declared themselves to be anti-Nazi, anti-communist, represented that they were victims, entered displaced persons camps, and came to England, Australia, the United States, and Canada. There were investigations in the United States. In one city block um, on the East Coast, 11 members of one killing unit lived near each other. Um, they gave each other cover. They um, test they testified on behalf of each other and they escaped culpability. The Lithuanians that were captured by the US government, Lithuania resisted receiving them as deportees and when they were returned to Lithuania, the Lithuanian government didn't punish them. The interim prime minister of Lithuania for the provisional government was named Brazaitis. Brazaitis, under any concept of law, was a Holocaust perpetrator. Like many of the Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators, he escaped to the West and was reburied in the United States. In 2012, the government of Lithuania exhumed his remains and repatriated them to Lithuania to be reburied with full state honors outside historical organizations told the Lithuanian government that he was a Holocaust perpetrator. Internal Lithuanian historical associations told the government of Lithuania that he's a Holocaust perpetrator. The Genocide Center said he had been completely exonerated and rehabilitated by the US government. A completely dishonest statement what it represents, they are willing to insult and demean the very members of Congress that are giving them NATO and US support. Their murderers are more important to them than the value of their state. Have we had any kind of justice? Has anyone been punished for these terrible crimes against us? Lithuania has not punished a single person that persecuted a Jew. Instead of, instead of punishing the murderers, they have named them as heroes. This is reflective of a national value system. And it's imperative that uh, Lithuania as a country, as a nation, and a government come to terms with their Nazi past and their role in the Holocaust uh, if they are to be fully accepted as a, a modern democratic state. Um, we're down to the last few minutes of the program, but um, yeah, of course we're doing a bit of research, um, particularly an excellent article that was, that was done about your film, J.Q.'s in, uh, in the Jewish news. Um, they refer that many prominent Jews of Lithuanian descent, uh, many will be very familiar with our viewers, of course the famous uh, musician, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Steven Spielberg, probably the best filmmaker in history, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and Bar Raffaelli. What is their reaction 
to what happened in Lithuania uh, and why is it so important to uh, the, the Jewish communities that descend from the Lithuanian community in Eastern Europe? I'm not sure it is that important to many Lithuanian Jews. We don't really identify ourselves as such anymore. We did in South Africa because we were so conspicuously from there. Most Jews will have maybe two Lithuanian grandparents, but they'll probably also have a Polish or a Romanian or a German or an Austrian or a French or even an English. Um, so that identity, which was really based on the Yiddish language, um, has, has, uh, has almost naturally declined. Um, I think that uh, the whole Lithuanian scenario has been um, subsumed into the general approach to the Holocaust. Um, so typically one probably thinks of Auschwitz, one doesn't think of the killing grounds at the back of a barn in the middle of rural Lithuania. I'm hoping though that uh, this film will excite some of these great names, and there are many of them, and there are many of them, to examine this and use their often repeated um, demands for human rights. Um, in this context, to demand that Lithuania tells the truth. But interestingly, I'm also interested in what Sylvia wants. Sylvia doesn't want to bash Lithuania. Sylvia loves Lithuania, it's her country. And she believes, and I agree with her, that what this process does is actually offers redemption to Lithuania. At the moment, you have a country whose youth are imprisoned within these lies. The government essentially forces them to become accomplices to murder when they are completely innocent. The idea of transmitted guilt is very important. And nobody with a brain or a, or a conscience believes in inherited guilt. You are not guilty because of what your grandparents or these days great-great-grandparents did. But when your government tells you that these mass murderers were heroes and then offers up, offers, up, offers up a dish of lies in support of that, you become complicit in that lying. So I very much support Lith uh, Sylvia in her, in her quest for redemption for Lithuania. I want nothing more than to be friends with Lithuania. But that friendship has to be based on the truth. Absolutely. It can't be based on the lies that they currently tell. So what actions would you like the Lithuanian government to take in response to your film? I mean, we, we've seen, for example, that uh, Germany has, has come to terms with its Nazi past. Um, there's been kind of uh, been Christian reconciliation uh, services, inviting prominent Jews and Christians together to pray and ask for forgiveness of what happened there. Uh, we, we, we've seen that uh, happen in, in South Africa as well, neighbor of Zimbabwe. Um, what would you like to see happen in Lithuania uh, and the response to the uh, Lithuanian government to come to terms with its Nazi past and realise that it needs to end its lies and its cover-up of its role during the Holocaust? Well, I just want them to tell the truth. I don't want to do anything more than that. I don't even mind if they keep their statues of Nareka and the other, we've counted about 12 mass murderers who they publicly hero worship. And in fact, they can keep their statues if they just add the words, and Holocaust mass murderer. All I want is the truth. And I believe this truth will liberate them as well as us. From the Jewish point of view, I don't think it's, um, it's tolerable because it continues the dehumanization that we experienced from 1941 onwards. It once again tells us that we are subhuman and we cannot expect to enjoy the same equality that other people have. For the Jews, it is absolutely non, uh, intolerable that such a thing should go on. But I think for European values also it's intolerable. If, Europe, if Europe believes in the sanctity of life, if Europe believes in the equality of peoples and the, um, the right of peoples to live a free life from prejudice, then they have to do something about this. They have to respond to this. In their own words, they're constantly telling us how much the Holocaust matters. You can tell from my body language, I don't believe a word they say. But if they believe it, they're obliged to do something. And so is the EU and NATO, because NATO tells us that it's there to support freedom. Well, freedom cannot be built on Holocaust lies and Holocaust mass murderers. And that's what it currently is being done in, in, in their name. So I don't think it's a very difficult thing, and I think Germany is exactly the example. Lithuania should do what Germany has done. And I hope Germany will lead the way in this. No, absolutely. And I think Germany should play a major role in, in, um, 
in, in bringing this awareness to Lithuania, particularly as Lithuania need our, our help and our protection from, uh, from Putin, and we see what's happening in the Ukraine as well. So they, they need our protection. Uh, they need our NATO troops uh, on their soil. Um, and it's important that they, as part of that, come to terms with their past as well. But for our viewers watching, um, how can they get hold of, of, of your incredible film and how can they watch it? You know, I made this film on a shoestring budget. I made it for $30,000, which I uh, begged and cajoled and borrowed from people who had a little bit of money to spare. I took no money myself. So I've never made it, it's always been free to release. At the moment we're trying to control how we distribute it. But I would be very interested in, 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 in providing it free of charge to Christian audiences um, throughout the world. And we are in discussions with people as to how we do this. So all I can say is watch this space and hopefully your television channel will be one of the ways we can distribute it. That would be amazing. Uh, and, and finally, reflecting on making this very powerful documentary, which is incredibly personal to you because it's about, about your family. It's about your Jewish traditions. It's where your Jewish family come from and its values, particularly in, in Zimbabwe. Um, concluding the interview and the documentary, um, how has this documentary changed you as a person? I can't say it's been an enjoyable um experience. Uh, you, you cannot enjoy something like this. Even if there's a success to the film, you can't enjoy it. You, you internalize certain things that, that happen that will never ever escape you. I think about it every day. I think about it in particular moments. And uh, I think it's a price one just um, accepts when one tries to tell the truth about such things. Um, I like to feel I've played some small role in uh, maintaining at least the cry for truth. Are we going to succeed? Frankly, Simon, I doubt it. I think um, realpolitik and uh, pragmatic politics will always win the day. And I think one of the, um, one of the casualties of this is, is, is the truth, is Holocaust truth. But people of conscience, I think, have a duty to try and tell the truth. And I think people of conscience have a duty to support people like Sylvia Foti in her astonishing efforts to tell the truth, particularly to the Christian world. And I wish anybody who does this the best of luck. Uh, Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Middle East Report and to be able to show your very powerful and moving documentary, JQs, and, uh, and to have that privilege of you telling your story about your uh, Lithuanian Jewish community and their fight for justice and I pray that you will get the justice that you deserve and thank you for making the film and I want to thank you for watching uh, this Middle East report today it's been difficult but I think it's essential that we know the truth that we know what happened to the Jews of Lithuania one of those hidden stories during the Holocaust that needs to be exposed in the light and we need to pray that what has been done in darkness will be exposed in the light and we see a repentance on behalf of the government of Lithuania so thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.